evening, everybody. We are working on chapter four this evening, and uh, you can see the topic for the chapter is uh, learning about the Ruby programming language. Now, we've had a little bit of background already, given that online tutorial that I had you go through and some of the introductory materials. But this is the chapter in our book where they actually start getting into it um, and explaining the constructs of the language and how it works, especially relative to how we'll be completing exercises in this book. So that um, is important. Now, the type of de web development that we're working on right now is server-side web development. So we are creating content that does require a server uh, to be able to actuate itself and to render web pages. So if you were working with the Ruby programming language as a back-end language for your project, the server that is running your website must have all the Ruby uh, language uh, programming tools and compilers and components and libraries available for use, as well as the Rails framework and uh, any database product that you would be using in conjunction with it, along with really a number of other technologies. Not all web servers are configured to run Ruby. In fact, that tends to be more of an oddball server-side language than most. When you're working in the open source world, which is really the world that we're working in right now, the real common languages for server-side are what? What's probably the most common server-side language? I hear someone say Java. It is a very popular one. Anybody else? C++. Nope. How about PHP? You guys learn your PHP? That's the one that you usually see on open source machines. So usually when we talk about open source web servers, we're looking at typically servers that are powered by Linux. Uh, they're running the Apache web server, the MySQL or Maria databases and PHP as a server-side language. Now, that does not prohibit you from using other languages on those machines, but typically if you are running a server that has uh, Ruby, it tends to be more of a specialized installation. In fact, there are web hosting services that specialize in offering those types of configurations uh, and, <coughs> and often strip away a lot of the other languages to not burden down the machine uh, with the infrastructure of doing multiple back-end languages. All right, what, what's cool is, you know, Ruby is a very modern type of programming language. Um, compared to some of the other languages that you have learned, which are, you know, I would call more traditional. For example, in our web program, uh, Java is like the big language that we teach. Uh, because Java is really a good foundational language for so many others and it's so similar to so many others. And not unlike some of those languages, you'll see the same types of constructs, obviously, in, in all languages, things like variables and loops and if statements and, and uh, other structures like that. But the approach that they use is a little bit different. And it's really you know, in my mind, a little bit more akin to languages like Python, and we don't teach that language here, but it is a language that is very commonly used for, for scripting and programming on many different platforms. And like Python has a lot of more modern, uh, you know, I would call clean approaches to putting code together. It's high level. It is. It is a high level language. Uh, it's highly abstracted, you know, and that actually that's a really good way to describe it, Tom. Um, all right, well, so let's go ahead and start looking at some of the stuff here. What's kind of interesting, um, and this is basically the technology that we played with during that tutorial, is that Ruby, as you guys have already seen by working uh, when we were building the blog in the previous chapter, there are Ruby programming files. So if like, you dig through your folder structure, you will find files that have a .rb extension to them, and you open them up and you see Ruby code. And it'll be a class file, there might be a loop, there might be some sort of a, a method defined or a function. Uh, but what we learned initially, we learned to do Ruby at a prompt, and that mode is available even on your machine if Ruby is installed. And that's what they're talking about here with IRB, and it's called the interactive Ruby prompt, meaning that you can type one command at a time into the uh, Ruby in, uh, command interpreter, 
and it will process it just like that. All right, so to get into an interactive prompt, let's just actually go ahead and bring up uh, our command prompt. And if you haven't already, go to your start menu, type CMD, bring up a command prompt. And then once you're at your prompt, it's a good idea to get out of your user folder. So I always like to do a CD space backslash just to get down to the root. And let's just go ahead and actually type IRB and press enter. And it launches pretty quickly. So now we have a different type of prompt. And this is the, the Ruby command prompt. And what we're going to do here is we are going to follow along with some of the stuff in the book. And it shows you if you type that command in, you get the prompt and it looks like this. And now from this prompt, we will be able to actually start typing in some of these commands. So I want you guys to follow along. And I know some of these are, you know, kind of almost ridiculously cumbersome really in, in terms of like kind of intro level things. Uh, but we have to do a hello world. And I know we kind of did this in that tutorial, but we're going to step through some of the examples here as well, just to kind of give you a refresher on some of the stuff we did. I would venture to guess that you guys probably forgot some of it already. You know, if you're not using it on a daily basis or doing big assignments with it, it's easy to, to kind of forget it. So let's go ahead and just uh, at the prompt type hello over scene or whatever you want to type, press enter. And the thing that you're going to see here, of course, folks, is that the way that Ruby works from the prompt is whenever you enter in some information, it's going to give you some sort of a response to indicate to you basically that it's recognizing that you're doing something and acknowledging and hopefully indicating that it worked. And in this case, I type hello over scene and somebody, yep, you type hello over scene. Oh boy. Uh, remember, we can do some math. It gives you the response just completely on the fly. It does have built in methods. And yes, there are places where you can go and look up all the methods that are available from the prompt. Um, but you can guess what this one's going to do, right? Time now. Well, gives us the time and a date October 11th. 5.54 p.m. What's minus 500? My bank account? Uh, that means we're five time zones away from Greenwich Mean Time. Yes, there is a zero line for time on the planet. Might have been sooner than that, but somewhere in that, during that time. The next one was time now dot year. It's kind of interesting, really, because you can really kind of guess at stuff, and it'll just kind of do it. Do you, do you think if I went like time dot now dot month, that would probably work? interesting and that's one of the things that it, you know it's done by design they really wanted the language to be very uh, friendly and if you've had any experience really working with other languages it should be pretty intuitive a lot of the methods are named the same a lot of that is not by accident uh, that is just so that things can get learned uh, quickly all right so in the next um, couple of pages here they start to talk about uh, data types. All right, so they're demonstrating that you can do uh, strings with double quotes. Or with single quotes. One of these times I'll type it right. Either one is okay, but look what happened after I typed it with single quotes. Yeah, yeah, it switched it, right? And they do show that in the book, so that's kind of interesting. The other thing that's kind of interesting is this next little tidbit, and it says, now is the pound sign curly brackets 
time.now. Close that. All right. And this is a, a little construct that we're going to start seeing used quite a bit. But whenever you see that pound sign and you see curly brackets, it indicates that it's a form of a hash. And it allows us to actually take things that are, you know, method constructs is one way to kind of look at it, and then intermingle it with the output of the string. So I'm, so I'm basically running the method. It's being convert. It's being hashed into a string, and then the string is outputting all together. And that that's really what's going on. Now, notice what they do in the next example. If I actually wanted to show the text in that fashion, I actually have to put in an escape character uh, prior to the pound sign or the hash sign, uh, and then it actually shows that as the string. So it treats it as text as opposed to executing what's within it. So that's, that's a handy little thing to know. There's uh, some other cool little methods here. So one is, for example, you got Toronto, Canada, and that's a string. So you, you notice you're not, we're not and we're having a discussion here in the background. I paused the video for a moment about how it's handling strings. It really, it really kind of does treat everything like a string in a sense, uh, just by virtue of having singular double quotes. And there is uh, a difference. There, there's a difference. The reason, remember, most programming languages offer both double and single quotes for strings is so that you can nest things within each other and do encapsulation and have methods by which like, if you wanted to show double quotes inside of a string, you want to show single quotes or intermingle them, you have some sort of methodology to do it. Uh, the other thing that's interesting here is because we're not really formally declaring any data types, it, it's automatically data typing things. And that's very much like JavaScript. JavaScript, you know, you're not, you're not stepping in and you're not saying that, you know, this is a, a long integer or a floating point number or an exponent or anything like that. You're, you just put a number in, might have a decimal place, it might not. You put a string in, you got a boolean, you say true, false, it just works. And in that capacity, Ruby is identical, meaning that it's pretty on the fly, intelligent about adjusting to those things. So a lot of that uh, we can really attribute to how they designed it. And all right, so I'm gonna carry on with this next example here, but now I'm just taking a string, and what, is, what do you suppose down case does? So just lower, lowercase, right? That's that's kind of a weird method name. And if you did the same thing, we call it Down syndrome. <laughs> well, we call it, and we do upcase. Makes everything cap. If you guys ever get a chance to go to Toronto, it's a cool town, by the way. I got a chance to uh, visit there a few years back. Actually, it's been quite a few years now, but really liked it. It was really Really, really cool town. All right, uh, we can do concatenation here. So concatenation uses the traditional plus sign. And I, I get lazy here, so I'm just gonna type whatever. And it just stitches them together. But notice, I didn't put any spaces in mine like the author did. So if I really wanted to actually have those things spaced apart, I actually have to kind of plan for that make it work. All right, so walk through all those examples and try them. Right here. All right, so at the top of this next page, he's got uh, a thing that basically is a piece of uh, information. And you might be wondering, well, how do I know what all the methods are? I mean, we can kind of anticipate some of them but you can see like down case and up case, I've never really seen those in other programming languages. Usually it's uppercase, lowercase, or you know some variation. Um, so what he's showing here is, is that you can, at the prompt, have some sort of a you know string, it doesn't really matter what it is, uh, and then type dot methods after it, and then 
here we go, here's a complete listing of all the methods that work with strings. You got that? I know, and that's not a very pretty looking list. Memorize now. Yeah. Uh, this will all be on the test. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but some of the basic ones might be on the test. Um, but it's interesting uh, to look at some of these that are available. All right, but that gives you an idea of some of the methods that go with. Uh, and you can type that command relative to other objects as well, and it'll give you a listing of all the methods that go as well. Some more, you know, he does some basic math. We've already seen that. And then he does some little bit more complicated. And I'm trying to copy the stuff he's got in there because he's got it in there for a reason. All right. Can we do negative numbers? You betcha. Can we divide? Is that what you expected? What would you be expecting normally in that circumstance? Well, yeah, you'd, you'd be expecting a number less, less than one but greater than zero, right? Uh, some sort of a decimal because, um, all right, so if I, if I did like 234 divided by 23, what are we not seeing? We're not seeing the decimals there. So that's kind of interesting. And why is that hap happening? Because it, it's seeing integers. So it's giving us an integer result. So if I wanted to do, um, okay, so if you look at his last example down here where he has like 234.1, let's say, divide by, you know, then it's going to give us a decimal answer. So there's just automatic casting that's happening here. So if you would put 234.00 That's correct. So if I would have just put zeros, point zeros after it, like this, I'm assuming that'll work. Yes, it does. So knowing that, you can leverage your inputs to... Yeah, that, that's a really good <coughs> question. What would be your guess on this? I think it'll pass if you are 12. My, your suspicion is correct, and my intuition told me exactly that, so. Now, let me sorry, here, he is indicating exactly the same thing that we just discovered. All right, this next thing that we're about to see is something called symbols, and this is something that is actually kind of, I'm not gonna say unique to this language, but the approach in which they utilize it is unique. And symbols really are basically a way to create certain types of objects that are, that are named. So for example, uh, notice what it says here, symbols are objects that work just like any other object in Ruby. They're used to point to some data that isn't traditional string object, um, they're kind of like strings, but you can't really modify them is the point. So take a look here. Let's type this first one in. The first one says my underscore symbol. All right, so it recognized it. So it's kind of reacting like it's a string. And then on the second one, it's asking us to type that again and then concatenate to it the second one. Now this doesn't work because we haven't defined second yet, so we can't really be adding them together. And then if I actually did define it, now I should be able to add them together. Well, it still says no. And why is that? They're empty. Yeah, there's, there's nothing really attached to them. That's correct. They are uh, empty. But notice that there's a, a, another thing going on here, and this is this concept that these are basically immutable. Once they are um, 
concocted, you're not going around changing them, but you can utilize them to do things. Now that seems like kind of a weird concept, but in this language, especially when we start interacting our application with a data model, so when we have the model part of the MDC, we often take the data that we pull out of the database and we instantiate it as an object. The original data is okay, we didn't do anything with it, we just took that data, instantiated it, and started using it. And that's one of the, the main uses for these types of objects. All right. Next uh, topic is arrays and hashes. Now, an array, which you guys should know what an array is at this point, but it's usually, in most languages, a named variable construct that has multiple positions for storage. And usually you refer to those storage positions with either index values numerically, uh, usually starting with zero, or the arrays can be associative in which there's key value pairs, so the positions are named, and then there's a value that goes with each name. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a real simple array, and uh, in this case, I'm just going to actually copy-paste this to save the typing. My mouse will let me. And what we're doing is we're, we're setting up a variable called city array, and it's actually an array, square brackets to indicate that we're working with an array, we're, we're sticking in there three string values, and there it is. And of course, if we use syntax that you guys should be familiar with, something like this, what's in array position zero? Toronto, what's in array position two? Paris. What's in array position three? No, nothing. All right. Want to change something in the array? In this case, they're changing position one, and he's putting New York in there. So now when we just output array position one, it has now changed. If I want to output the whole array again, I just type city array. See how intuitive that is? That, that's like very, very simplistic. It works really well. Um, you, you could assign it an integer value, right? And it would work. It should. Um, let me do this Los Angeles example like he does in the book. This is where we're concatenating an array position. You see it just added Los Angeles. But what Tom is asking, can we just, could we add a... Sign index. Can we just go like city array index position equals integer value? You probably could. You want to experiment with it, go for it. Um, but, I mean, would you want me to like just try to throw a number in there and see if it breaks? Uh, it doesn't break. It uh, doesn't care what goes in there. Right. So like if you did city array one <laughs> and you could redefine it as an integer value and it would be that seamlessly. I mean in essence that's exactly what I just did. Um, even though even though it's predefined. So if, for example, if I did that and just put a number in and then if I just type city array hmm it works it just works so like JavaScript it doesn't really care what goes into into arrays now that can be you can mismatch data types you can Absolutely. You know, for some people that's a little uncomfortable if you come from an old school like strict data typing approach. Um, but this is the way of the modern world, folks. That's why a lot of people love to work with JavaScript is just because of, of that. Now, the other concept that we're going to look at is this thing called a hash. And hash is used, hashes are used pretty extensively uh, in this. And in many ways, they behave like arrays. And that, that's what's a little strange. 
So if you look at um, the first example that they have here, and you know, once again, I'm just going to copy paste this just to save time. And I'll, I'll paste it over and then uh, describe it a little bit. So what we're doing here is what, in some languages, it, and it really depends on what, what languages you've worked with and what languages you've seen. But this, to me, like if you think of, think of, you know, maybe you've learned this in PHP and maybe you have not. Or maybe you've learned this in Java and maybe you have not. I would like to think that if you've taken enough programming languages, you've probably encountered this kind of construct where we have array structures, basically, because this is really what it is. And instead of each position having an index numeric value, we have a name for the position. So, for example, the first position in this hash, or if you want to think of it as an array, is called Canada. It's not called zero. So, in some circles, we call this key value pairs. So this is the key, and that's the value. If you think of, you know, transmission of information using the JSON format, which is used pretty extensively in Ruby on Rails, uh, and, and really one of the reasons why this construct exists, that's done exactly in that fashion. Usually it's within curly brackets, comma separated, and then some sort of uh, indicator of value and, and um, what the key is. So in this case, we're, we're creating a thing called my hash, and inside of it are all these key value pairs. So we have a construct called Canada, its value is Toronto, construct called France. Now notice that these are basically symbols, right? So we learned that symbols, in a way, are immutable, right? And for creating a hash and having something as really the index value or the array position value via an immutable symbol makes a lot of sense because it's not something you really want to be changing. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and press enter on that. And then, of course, what it does is it spits back to us all the stuff that went in into uh, that hash. All right. Then sort of similar to an array, we want to start pulling values out of here. Now we're using square brackets and the symbol name. And then that will pull back the value that's paired with that symbol. If I typed in Canada, it brings back Toronto. If I want to change that Canada value to something else, do it just like that. Interestingly, just to show you that these are indeed key value pairs, if you just type my hash dot keys, it shows you what all the keys are. That's a handy little method. You want to see which one is first? I skipped that one. Shows you the first position, key, and value. All right. So now they're trying to give you a little bit of a distinction between the two. So he's going to do this little one called numbers array and then he's got his square brackets and he just goes one two three four five which of course is our number array but we can also do a numbers hash now let's say equals there here's our curly brackets so we go one and you know this is enough that I might want to just copy paste it not to be lazy but will be. Also keeps me from making mistakes. Are there reasons why we use one approach versus another? Absolutely. A lot of times that has to do with transmission of data from one program component to another or to a database or to an external source. 
and how those mechanisms work with that information. You will find that, uh, especially in modern programming, that JSON has really taken a pretty important role in data transmission, especially data that has to be serialized, meaning that it has to be basically in one long string. So it, it's really kind of become a popular and really very efficient uh, way to transmit information. So as I think we've kind of already discovered, you know, we're doing a, a test. Well, he's calling a test variable, so let's just do that. Yes, you can make it a string. Yes, you can make it a number with the same name. Yes, you can make it a floating point number. It's dynamic, it will adjust. All right, now we're coming up to this section in the book that gets a little interesting. And these are things you want to really kind of pay careful attention to. You will see, uh, for example, different little symbols being used, and some of the key ones are right here. Like we've already seen the fact that if we preface something with a colon, it in essence becomes a symbol, right? And we may have seen in some of our examples, maybe even have typed it into some of our code, where we type in some stuff and it might be prefaced by an at sign, right? And then you probably aren't aware of this yet, but there's also the double at sign. And let's just take a look at the definition here. The very first one, the double at sign, indicates that it's a class variable. Well, that's that's kind of interesting. So that means it's a variable that that um, how do I put this? It works inside of a particular class, but not necessarily um, everywhere. Um, and the way that he puts it exists in the scope of a class. So all instances of a specific class have a single value for the class variable. All right. Now, versus the one that we'll probably use more often, which is an instance variable. And that means that you think of what an instance refers to in, in terms of object-oriented programming. You guys already understand this, I, I am assuming, that you have a class and then you instantiate an object, and then that instanti instantiation exists. At, and basically, it's showing you that it's an instance by virtue of its naming convention. That can be very helpful when you're troubleshooting. And it also helps you understand that often some of the things that you're working with, particularly with data coming out of a database, you often instantiate it on the fly to utilize it. And then it goes away. Or sometimes you write it back to the database if it changes. It just depends on what you're doing. But it's a good thing to know. You know, now notice this next one. Yes, you can create constants uh, by capitalizing the first letter of, letter of a variable, but it's a convention that it's all uppercase. So you guys caught that? So if you want to make something a constant, you name it with a capital letter first. It doesn't have to be all caps. But as in most programming languages, people do all caps, so you look at it and that's just kind of what you know. Yes. And uh, another thing here, the local variables. Please do it. <laughs> um, and one thing that you're going to see here as they start to get deeper into the book is they strongly encourage very verbose, descriptive naming constructs. And not just talking for variables, but for methods, for files. Um, so my string, that, that's a short one, but you might create a variable for, you know, tax rate for tax returns for 2017 inclusive. And you go, why would I want a variable name that long? The language is, encourages you to do that very simply so that it's easy to read and that's easy to understand what something is and that's important. Alright, as we do with 
uh, most languages we, we talk about the various types of operators. I know we've looked at this stuff briefly already. Um, notice the, the square brackets. Notice the square brackets with the equal sign. You know, whenever you see an equal sign in there, that is an assignment statement in just about every language. But interestingly here, you can also do it with the square brackets. That, that's kind of fascinating. Of course, you have all the standard mathematical operators, uh, including uh, the percent sign, which does what? Modulus. Modulus, right. You guys should know that. Uh, some standard comparison, greater than, less than, equal to, etc. The double The double, I'm not, I think that's a typo. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, well, oh no, actually it can't be a typo. Uh, we'll have to look that up. Somebody look it up for me. I, I guess I didn't notice it as a double asterisk there at the end. I wonder if that's an exponent. We're pensively waiting for a Wikipedia answer here in class. Right, I, yeah, exponent. So a double, double asterisk is, is an exponent. But see how easy it is to like even just kind of guess as to what it does? Just educated guess. Um, notice that they also have uh, range indicators. And those are kind of uh, interesting. You don't really see that in a lot of other languages. But you can use dot, dot, or dot, dot, dot. Uh, we do have operators for doing um, logical comparisons uh, and inclusions. So we have uh, and, and notice there's two different types of ors. There's the regular or, which is the pipe, and that, and that you see in other languages. Um, and then you also see what they call the exclusive or. And a lot of languages have that as an operator, but very few people uh, understand how it operates so they usually kind of skip over it and, and code around it and then of course you also see the double ampersands and double pipes nots ors and and so you can actually spell those out as well as use the symbols which is kind of neat because that way if you're jumping from like visual basic to this and you forget and you type it one way and it works and you know what folks a lot of languages do that. A lot of them allow for single ampersands and double ampersands. And you might not be aware of that because you're taught to do it like the right way. Uh, but next time you play with PHP or Java, instead of doing the double ampersand, try a single ampersand and see what happens. Well, it's a different type of or. Uh, an exclusive or, depending on the language you're working with. Um, like, for example, if you guys learn Visual Basic and learn an XOR, and what that basically does, it's a, it's a way to do uh, a short circuit, in a sense. Some languages sh short circuit automatically, and some languages you can tweak them to short circuit. So what a short circuit means is when you're trying to test a statement for truth, and you have ors in it, right? And for an or to be true, only one condition has to be true. So if I had like this or this or this or this, let's say you know, a bunch of different ors, as soon as it hits the first one, it's done. Some languages do that automatically. So this one's telling you that you can actually force it to do that. We also have these fancy ternary operators that we're seeing in all the languages now um, and tend to confuse people a little bit. So if you look at this statement here real carefully, and it says A equals 10 and B equals 20, right? So interpret this for me and tell me whether it's true or false. And what the hell does it say? Here's the breakdown of, of how these operators work. This is really a replacement, folks, for if statements, right? And if you had Java with me, I probably grueled it into you. But when you see the question mark and the colon, basically what you have here is the statement that's being tested for truth. If true, do what's after the question mark. If false, do what's after the colon. And this really only works well for very simplistic statements. It's not really meant for like if you're going to have multiple lines of code in the if or the else. 
But if you just have one little simple action that's happening, then it works. So is A greater than B? No. So the, what's the result? B. So that's why you get the output of 20 for that statement. And if you want, you could type that stuff in and it would spit back just like that. All right, so we're getting the language in a nutshell, right? The whole language in, in 20 minutes. All right, let's go ahead and do this little section on loops here, and then we'll probably look at taking a break. All right, so they kind of bunch a couple concepts together here, really. Uh, the one is uh, blocks and iterators. And whenever we refer to a block or a block of code, it really is any code that is encapsulated together. Now, unbeknownst to many of you, when you guys are working in other languages, and, and I, I use Java as an example often because we teach that in the web program, but usually when you put curly brackets around something, it's because you've got a method, right? You've got a named method, and you might say like public, static, void, whatever, throw some arguments in there, some curly brackets, you've got a series of steps that you complete. But the truth is, whenever you put curly brackets around something you're creating a block of code and that block of code becomes kind of exclusive unto itself so um, in this case what what they refer to as a block of code is a fragment of code between curly braces once again same concept or do n construct so when we were looking at some of those ruby code files some of the code blocks or the method statements will start with do and they end. Now do, you guys will recognize as probably being some sort of a loop, maybe a do while loop, and end telling it to terminate. All right, an iterator of course, this is their way of calling it a loop, right? So when I say like reiterate, so this is English lessons 101, it means I'm repeating myself, and to iterate is to say it once, right? So iterators are things that say things. If you want to play a little bit, and you can type these in if you wanted to, but he's just doing it as an example. He's indicating if we had these commands typed in, five dot times puts hello. And if you execute that command, that is a way to say, basically, for i from one to five, print hello or whatever. Isn't that an interesting way to do it? So way different type of syntax than you guys are used to unless you've worked with other you know, weird modern languages. But this is the way that they do it here. So this is just a really a simple loop or iterator. So five times, we declare it numerically, we're going to put hello, that's equivalent to like an echo or a print or a right line or whatever you want to consider it. These shortcuts are created by using the precedence of the characters. They are, very much so. All right. Notice this next little example here. This one's kind of interesting. What kind of construct does this relate to? Without me formally telling you what's going on. We got array. some sort of an array, right? Yeah. 1, comma, 2, comma, 3, comma, 4, comma, 5, dot each. And we got item puts item. What is it? What is this? Yeah, yeah, that's a print. Yeah, the puts is, a, is like outputting. We figure that one out. But what's each about? What construct would you guys compare this to? Well, let me clue you in. It would be the equivalent of a for each loop. So basically, this is something that will iterate through each item in that array. And every time that item comes in, we will output it. So we just step through. We're doing each of them, and we're putting them on the screen. All right ramp up the example a little bit. This next one also has an array. 
right? But this time it's a, it's an array of strings or, or characters, if you want to look at it that way. And notice it says each, but there's a little more there. It says each with index. So it is not only passing the value, but it's also passing the index value as well. So that's why here you're seeing both the item, which will be the letters, and the index, which will be their position. So what's going to happen here is now we have an actual more looks like more like a loop construct because all of a sudden we have something inside of it, right? So we have a more complicated series of steps, but we are putting out a string of text which includes a hashed version of the item and the index value and then dot dot dot. So for each one of these, so three times over, it's going to output A and its position or dash dash dash, B its position, dash dash dash, C its position, dash dash dash, and it's done. Isn't that interesting? Very simple. Very simple syntax, very powerful. All right, this is really a good place uh, to stop and take a break. Um, so I'm going to terminate this video here, and we'll start a fresh one when we come back from break. Let's take five.